All right, so we can go ahead and start. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad that you're here and joining us for this webinar on Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, for identification, reach, and monitoring of zero-dose children in communities. Please note that we're recording the session so you can watch it later. And there is simultaneous translation. So Spanish speakers, kindly press the globe on the bottom of your screen for simultaneous translation into Spanish. I'm Emily Nicholson, Digital Health Business Analyst for the region, and have the pleasure of being joined by Rocco Pensiera and Ivana Camacho Alvarez this morning. Rocco is the Geospatial Health Specialist Lead in the Digital Health and Information Systems Unit, or DHNIS, in UNICEF's health section in New York. Rocco joined UNICEF as a GIS consultant in 2016 and is now coordinating UNICEF's global portfolio related to the use of geospatial technologies for health programs. The core of his work is to support UNICEF country offices in applying geospatial technologies for specific health programs, as well as ensuring sustainability and country ownership of GIS capacity. Ivana is our immunization technical support in LACRO, and also the health monitoring and technical assistance specialist in the Bolivia country office. She is supporting the Survive and Thrive team and joined UNICEF as a national UNV in 2021, now supporting UNICEF LACRO immunization team since February of 20, February 22nd, and we'll keep her on until August 18th of this year. We're really excited about that. The objective of Ivana's work is to coordinate and support UNICEF country offices in all matters related to immunization strategies developed at the country or regional level. Finally, I regret to share that Ralph is unable to join us today as he's in Haiti dealing with an emergency. He sends his regards to each of you and wants to share that he hopes we have specific country requests for the use of geospatial tools to identify zero-dose children and to map health facilities in order to develop the most appropriate strategies to make vaccination services available and accessible to all. Without further ado, I'm going to hand the screen over to Ivana. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Emily, for the presentation and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in this session. And the first session is like, uh, uh, about... Ivana, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm not sure, Rocco, are you also having trouble Hello? hearing Hello. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I have I had to keep uh, close to my microphone. So I was uh, telling everybody that we are going to share with you some present a little questions, some a few questions just to 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 engage uh, everybody with the with our um, sorry, I need to. Do you confirm that? Sí, se ve Ivania la imagen. Solo que tú te escuchas cortada a veces. Okay, so sorry. So you can see the, the presentation now. Yes, Ivana, we can see it. Um, and colleagues, there is a Minty. Website in the chat along with the code. Yes. And this is the you have this link in the chat and you have this code to enter if or if you have a QR app scan, you can scan this QR. So then you can go to the summary. So we are going to follow everybody already. We are in the first question, and the first question is just to introduce some words about uh, if you would like to include answers. We have answers, so we can see your. Good, we have 
one answer. Maybe we will wait a little bit more and we have more. Great. Good. I think we can go to the next one. Uh, since we have enough questions, I think. And then in the next question, you can choose more than one of the options you have here presented, like you have five options. Which benefits do you hope from GIS can bring to the zero dose agenda and immunization program? And you can put more than one, one answer. Great. I think we have all our answers. And then we can go uh, to our last uh, question. So uh, yeah, we have six ready to answer. Yep. And, uh, and in this question, you can raise your hand to uh, share with us. Uh, what was this, the first question here? I don't know what is not showing us the question. Uh, in this case, our question was if a GIS is in use in, uh, is planning to use in your country office, or maybe you are using already a GIS in some of your programs. If yes, please mention in which area you are using the GIS uh, system or GIS platforms. If someone wants to raise your, their hand or talk with us or put in the chat also. Maybe Rana, better if we ask people to put it in the chat so that- uh, Great, we, we so we can time. continue. Yes. Good. So I think with that, uh, we finish our, our quick uh, interview here. And then I stop to let you the floor, Rocco. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see some, uh, some inputs in the chat regarding uh, existing uh, GIS applications that uh, people know of uh, in, uh, in, uh, in some of the countries uh, in the region. So let me uh, share my screen. Uh, I hope that you can uh, see it coming now. Please uh, give me a yes or a nod. Uh, we when... can see Rocco, thank you. Okay, uh, great. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you today um, uh, to give you this overview on uh, the use of geographic information systems for identification, reach, and monitoring of uh, zero dose children and communities. And thank you to the regional team and particularly to Ralph, Emily, and Ivana for uh, the introduction and for uh, organizing uh, this event. Uh, I think this is quite timely given the uh, growing expertise um, uh, of UNICEF around utilization of GIS for immunization programs and health programs, uh, and also the uh, ongoing uh, development of the regional uh, immunization uh, strategy. Um, and I hope that the material presented today will uh, be helpful to some of the colleagues uh, on this call, to many of the colleagues on this call. Uh, so. I'll uh, leave the floor to uh, Jonathan uh, to give us a quick uh, intro on the original strategy development. Or to you, Jonathan. Yeah, no, it, it, in this case, it will be me. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. okay. Yep. So just to share you a little bit what we are working in the, about the immunization regional strategy. Uh, the purpose of this strategy is to identify opportunities and, and challenges for collaboration between programs and not only health teams or not only immunization teams, uh, but all the, the teams together. So we are concerned, uh, putting our focus on three main uh, groups, like zero-dose children, under-immunized child, child, 
or children and missed communities that um, are the focus of this strategy. So the main, and you have been heard uh, hearing about this uh, many times, maybe about the zero dose entry point and that why they are the, the, the main entry point in, in this strategy. It's because they are, there's a study here, we can share with you the link about the, the correlations between uh, the lack of immunization access and lack of, to lack of uh, access into the many services, primary healthcare services or a wash services, for example, like the main ideas we have around. And also, uh, it's because uh, it's not only a health issue, but it is involved with many of the other areas we have uh, we have been working here in in, in UNICEF. So the strategy uh, aims to engage all the areas around the zero dose children, and especially for for the immunization strategy, like as an entry point for the pri for reinforcement of the primary healthcare system. So we have key challenges here. Uh, first, to establish a target for the zero dose uh, using projections or GIS as, an, as, an, as a tool. And then we have uh, the accurately identification and tracking the zero dose with the global and country data system and positioning immunization, of course, for, the, for a platform for health system and strengthening. So, that's from a brief uh, uh, words of the immunization strategy we are working on, and it's still going on uh, in its construction. Thank you. Now over to you, uh, Rocco. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ivana, for that uh, good perspective. Uh, and I have to say this presentation is uh, somehow uh, Focus on the on the immunization uh, services side of things, but uh, um, clearly the discussions around uh, the role of GIS to link uh, health and nutrition with education and wash is something that I will try to uh, point uh, to as well. Uh, so a quick outline of today. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I will be giving you a, a broader perspective of what GIS um, is and how it can be uh, of benefit to UNICEF health programs more broadly. And then I will dwell with some details into how uh, this can specifically support identification and reach of uh, zero dose children and communities. Uh, in the second part, I uh, will provide some practical considerations and guidelines uh, with regards to the implementation and costing uh, and funding of GS applications at country uh, level and discuss what type of support is available to uh, UNICEF country offices. Um, so let's start uh, with a brief overview of the use of GS for a uh, health uh, program. Um, uh, let, first, let's start with a bit of a clarification. Um, you know, that there's a uh, Despite the, the definition, there's uh, frequently a bit of a um, confusion around the meaning of GIS or the application of GIS uh, outside of the GIS community. It's sometimes thought to be, uh, you know, uh, the, the map itself, a uh, database uh, or computer software or a specific uh, uh, methodology. Uh, and, and the reality is that uh, GIS is, is all these things uh, none of these individually, but all of them uh, at once and, and as a system. It's, a, it's an information system, um, so it is an integrated collection of data, of hardware, of software, but also of the people um, that support this process and on the technologies that support this process. Uh, and the process being uh, capturing geospatial data, managing geospatial data, editing geospatial data, and finally analyzing uh, and visualizing spatial information according to their uh, spatial location, which is the defining uh, kind of element. It, it, it's an information system that organizes information based on their um, uh, spatial location. So to, to better illustrate this, let me uh, show you how these elements will practically realize themselves in a, in a typical scenario where a country has a GIS capacity in a relevant government agency. 
uh, you would have people uh, as part of this information system, which are GIS technicians in the government that know how to use the GIS software to analyze the spatial data for the health sector. Uh, you will have health sector personnel uh, that know how to interpret GIS maps for decision makings and are trained to do that. You would have software, uh, computer softwares or dash GIS dashboards uh, that are available uh, to the uh, GIS technicians. Uh, you would have data, uh, spatial data sets, like for example, location of settlements, health facilities and so on that are being maintained by the relevant government agency and shared uh, for, it, for use for analysis. And then you had all the other elements uh, as shown in the diagram. Um, at the end of this process, uh, people, data, software, uh, and uh, uh, hardware and methods um, will realize themselves in uh, GIS products. For example, like a map, electronic or printed, that will be available for planning and monitoring to address health programs. Um, and we will touch today also on this issue of the enabling environment um, that is required to sustain uh, this process. So what are the main functionality of GIS uh, to support health? Uh, we can summarize them in four. Um, uh, it empowers health programs to precisely locate population uh, to locate individual clients or, or patients, infrastructure, commodities, human resources, uh, and health events. For example, when the location of a children, where, where a ch children is vaccinated at a particular location that we can locate that particular health event. Uh, GIS also allows to organize health data and related data based on geographic location. Uh, which allows us, for example, to uh, um, relate uh, population with uh, health infrastructure uh, distribution in space. And thanks to all this, it helps us to analyze the spatial relationship between population, health resources, and the environment. And this improves our understanding of the health systems uh, and of the location of vulnerable populations uh, and help us uh, optimize the planning and the delivery of health programs. Finally, uh, it allows us to visualize health data for advocacy and uh, decision making. So through these four main functions or four main functionalities, UNICEF, uh, GIS can support uh, the UNICEF uh, mandate and strategic growth plan Global Area 1. Uh, and it does so by uh, supporting closing uh, uh, the uh, gaps in uh, population accounted for, in the availability of supply versus demand of services, and gaps in equitable access uh, and coverage. The diagram here shows uh, this through the Tanahashi model of health coverage, uh, where um, you can see the role of GIS applications, of some GIS applications that we will discuss today in uh, uh, filling that gap uh, that exists in terms of available supply, accountability of population, demand for services to reach uh, the health system goals. And GIS does that clearly alongside uh, other uh, interventions and tools. Um, can I do a quick check with the, uh, with the uh, translator that I'm not speaking too fast? Is it the pace is okay? Okay, so I don't hear any um, comment there, so I'll, I'll assume it's okay. Um, so this is a brief visual gallery of some of the main uh, GIS applications uh, that have seen increasing use in both by UNICEF and other organizations. Um, I will go into details in the next part of the talk into a few of them that are particularly relevant to the Zero Doors agenda. Uh, and in particular, we will talk about mapping population distributions. Uh, we will talk about uh, mapping geographic accessibility and coverage to health resources. Uh, and also we will touch on 
uh, local level um, micro planning of service delivering using GIS. Uh, but you can see here uh, uh, a variety of application of GIS for um, uh, health um, to support health programs, uh, including uh, detailed geolocation of households and clients for targeted healthcare interventions and uh, 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 geographically targeted disease uh, surveillance, just to name uh, a few. So let's focus now, um, let's narrow down the focus on the uh, application to zero dose uh, children, uh, to the zero dose children agenda. In this section, I will structure the discussion making use of a, a framework introduced by Gavi, uh, which is the IRMMA framework, uh, identify, reach, monitor, measure, and advocate, uh, which um, uh, you might be uh, uh, familiar with. Uh, the IRMMA framework is at the core of the Gavi uh, 5.0 vision of leaving no one behind, um, and also is uh, linked to the immunization agenda 2030. The framework provides guidance on a number of key questions to guide the development of strategies at country level to reach zero dose children and missed communities. Uh, how many children are eligible? Where do they live? Why are they uh, unvaccinated? And uh, uh, are there enough supplies to, to reach eligible children and so on? Uh, I find this um, uh, framework particularly useful uh, to structure the discussion because, as mentioned earlier, uh, GIS is an information system which comprises an array of tools. So uh, we shouldn't think about a single GIS solution addressing uh, the identification, reach, and monitor of zero dose children in its totality. Uh, rather, GIS can support uh, the, the IRMAA framework through strengthening multiple programmatic areas. For example, one could use innovative geospatial data sources and spatial analysis to support planning and coordination, or one could use GIS dashboard to support the management of human resources to research to reach uh, these communities. So I am going to propose a description of how GIS can support the Zero Dose Agenda uh, from a point of view of the programmatic areas, uh, but also from the point of view of the functional phases of the uh, of this cycle that might be useful uh, to uh, clarify uh, all the possible application. So let's look at the functional view first. Uh, here's a list of the type of information products and GS applications that can facilitate identification, reach, uh, monitor, measure, and advocate uh, for zero dose children. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, just a light a few main ones. Um, we can improve the identification of zero dose children by strengthening information on population denominators using innovative population mapping techniques applied to satellite imagery, imagery for example. And we can combine this with subnational estimates of vaccination coverage that are obtained uh, from geostatistical modeling of survey data. We can enhance the mapping of communities and informal settlements using satellite images uh, and improve uh, identification and inclusion of these remote communities in outreach plan. We can plan, we can map health infrastructure, uh, and this provides the basis for assessing supply side service availability, and uh, in particular, the assessment of accessibility to services to help identify the reasons for missed vaccinations. Um, once, zero, once zero dose children are um, uh, more clearly identified and located, GIS can inform the product, production of GIS-based microplans, uh, displaying location of immunization services, health catchment area boundaries, and communities to strengthen local level planning. We can also use support uh, real-time monitoring and supervision of vaccination campaigns um, uh, through the use of uh, GPS-enabled mobile and tablet applications. In terms of monitoring, 
We can, for example, use GIS dashboard in the health management information system, for example, in the DHS2, to support visualization of the subnational variation in vaccination coverage and supply side data to uh, identify geographic regions that are lagging uh, behind. I should also mention a number of cross cutting functions uh, that GIS allows that are relevant across the cycle and relevant across. Um, Non uh, immunization specific programs. Uh, for example, uh, the maintenance of authoritative georeferenced master lists uh, of some of the core data sets like health infrastructure location, settlements location, community health workers location, and uh, administrative boundaries. Uh, these are at the core of all the analysis displayed in this page and are also central to GIS analysis of uh, other um, programs that might be relevant uh, to the zero dose agenda as mentioned before. Uh, so this cross-cutting functionality uh, allows GIS to serve as a, um, a integra integrating uh, factor between uh, immunization uh, and the wider primary health care. So the same applications are here summarized in the top line uh, and are listed in terms of their impact to the various programmatic areas that when combined together can contribute to uh, the um, uh, zero dose agenda. Uh, the, the table might probably be useful to those of you and I suspect it might be most of you uh, that might be more interested on strengthening specific aspect of the immunization program. And you can see here that some GS applications like high resolution population mapping, mapping of health infrastructure, GS based microplanning are broadly supportive across multiple programmatic areas. Um, other GS applications like uh, utilization of GS dashboards in the health management information systems uh, are, um, can be considered more relevant to specific programmatic areas. Just noting that the division in this table are, are not always so clear and cut um, and should be taken with some flexibilities. And, and this table will probably evolve um, uh, with uh, more nuance on um, uh, how each uh, GIS application can support various programmatic areas. But it, I think it can be a good start uh, to, to orient um, uh, to orient you towards identifying specific um, areas that you might be interested in. So let me now give you a bit more detailed look into some of the GIS applications uh, we mentioned. And we're not going to be able to go into detail uh, on all of them, but I'll give you some uh, important examples. And also please note that not all these cases presented here uh, have been supported or deployed uh, by uh, UNICEF. Uh, the first application is the high resolution mapping of zero dose children, uh, which is a first step towards uh, identification. Uh, this process allows us to provide granular estimates of children uh, that have not received any vaccina vaccination for an entire country uh, with fine geographic details uh, down to the community level. Uh, the method consists on estimating population density and step one, uh, which is derived uh, through satellite data combined with census or microcensus surveys to uh, extrapolate population estimates over a fine grid uh, covering the entire country. Uh, with a fine grid, I mean something like one kilometer resolution or one me uh, 100 meter resolutions. In step two, uh, we can estimate vaccination coverage over the country uh, through the statistical techniques uh, that are applied uh, to national surveys. For example, uh, this is generally done using the coverage of the first dose of DPT-1 as a proxy um, for uh, um, lack of access to vaccination as a proxy of zero dose uh, children. In the, in the third step, the two data can be combined together to provide maps of number of zero dose children at high resolution, like in the case of Kenya shown here. This uh, maps have the advantage of 
being somewhat independent from routine um, administrative data that at times have um, uh, some issues with uh, quality and completeness uh, and uh, can also be aggregated to uh, any area of interest. Uh, we can estimate the number of children for specific districts, for sub-districts, and other uh, areas of interest. The second main GS application is um, uh, we'll discuss is the mapping of G uh, physical accessibility to services and in particular to vaccination sites. Um, this is a common application utilized to identify areas uh, that have limited accessibility uh, to vaccination services. It consists of using information on the geolocation or the coordinates, you might know them by, of vaccination sites, and combine this with spatial information, the terrain to be traversed to reach vaccination sites. So population will need to go through roads, paths, steep terrain, land cover, different type of land covers, rivers, bridges. We account for this in the GIS, and this allow us to obtain maps of the estimated time that population will take to reach the nearest vaccination site. This map provides information in a way that can be aggregated to any specific area, uh, areas relevance of planning, uh, such as districts and health catchment area. For example, on the bottom here, you can see that the information on the travel time to the nearest health, uh, vaccination sites has been summarized by district in terms of the number of the percentage of population that is further away than one hour from a uh, vaccination uh, site as a way to show how this can be used to identify children or, or areas where you might have more um, uh, children with an issue with uh, access. Let's now talk about uh, GIS microplanning to strengthen local level planning of service deliveries. And I'm using here a um, uh, case from the measles campaign in Nigeria, uh, which is well documented. Uh, GS based microplanning involves combining the two previous applications we have seen, uh, that is using spatial information on population distribution, location of health infrastructure, and the connecting environment in order to locate underserved communities, uh, identify vaccination strategies to reach them and optimize the deployment of resources. This is done by creating accurate GIS products, uh, either printed maps or, or GIS dashboards with this information that contain uh, detailed geographic information of the health catchment area. Uh, these maps are fine-tuned uh, through consultation with local users and decision-making processes. Uh, and, and then these GIS products are utilized during the microplanning process. Um, the information can uh, inform many steps of the process, including uh, fine-tuning the boundaries of catchment areas, uh, locate underserved communities uh, that will require outreach and uh, optimize location of uh, outreach vaccination sites. As shown on the right here, in the example of here of Nigeria, the use of GS microplants delivered an improvement of measles coverage uh, in 19 Nigerian states where the method was applied. Um, clearly, uh, frequently, this improvement in coverage uh, cannot uh, necessarily uh, in, in individually be attributed to GIS maps as there's a man many factors to consider, uh, but that there is evidence of uh, the um, uh, uh, positive impact of the application of GS-based microplanning. Closely linked to just based microplanning is the near real-time monitoring of vaccination campaigns and tracking of vaccination teams that is possible through GPS-enabled tools such as Android uh, phones. This is particularly useful in remote areas um, and uh, where vaccination teams can be tracked using their GPS-enabled Android phones, meaning their location is recorded every few minutes. And uh, this provides um, as you can see on the top two images, detailed verifiable information on the communities that are visited and those that have been missed. 
Uh, this method was, this data can then be reviewed on a daily basis by campaign supervisors through dashboards uh, and, and corrective action can be taken. Uh, this method, for example, in Nigeria, uh, supported polio eradication effort as in, has led, as you can see, on a significant decline on the number of settlements that were clinically missed um, and were uh, therefore highly likely, highly likely we had zero dose children. Uh, GPS enabled Android phones uh, can not only support tracking of vaccination teams, but also tracking of individual uh, children. In this example from Pakistan, a phone based electronic immunization registry system uh, has been expanded with GIS capability to provide coordin coordinates and location of children, residences, and of the locations where they are vaccinated. This information uh, is recorded for each uh, registered children and allows monitoring who is being missed uh, by vaccinations and planning for targeted outreach during catch-up vaccination uh, activities. So once available, this geolocation information can be displayed at different scales, uh, for example, aggregated to provincial level or oversight and planning, or we can look at individual location of children at the community level for uh, informing vaccination teams outreach. Uh, this method was used in Pakistan um, to inform uh, vaccinations after many children had missed uh, vaccinations during the COVID-19 lockdowns. Uh, and as you can see, uh, resulted in a decline in um, unvaccinated children in the uh, ensuing months. Uh, to conclude this quick showcase, I would like to mention a special case of urban informal settlement, which I know is very relevant to the region. Uh, informal urban settlements represent specific challenges to immunizations, uh, and the use of satellite image and GPS enabled devices has allowed uh, in the past, uh, supported uh, urban vaccination efforts in a number of ways. Uh, for example, uh, delineation of informal settlements uh, and estimation of their population can be uh, aided by satellite images analysis. Um, we can uh, support knowledge of the location of health infrastructure nearby informal settlements through um, GPS location. Uh, and use this to visualize gaps in access to services by slum dwellers. Uh, and, and all this information can be used for better planning for vaccination sessions, schedules, schedules and, and locations to, to better serve uh, uh, slum dwellers. And there's an example here from India, Bihar state, where um, uh, immunization was vastly uh, improved in urban uh, uh, areas, in highly dense urban areas. Uh, thanks to the application of this uh, technology. So I hope this uh, gave you a bit of a partial sense of what is possible. Uh, let's let's now look at practical considerations on how this can be implemented. So first of all, UNICEF approach in the deployment of GS applications is that uh, they should not be seen uh, as isolated. Uh, and deployed as one of solutions uh, for specific programs. Um, we, we recommend uh, overall that uh, the aim is to achieve a long-term and sustainable use of GIS in, uh, across health programs. Uh, and this can be achieved by embedding uh, geospatial data and geography within health system workflows and business processes. And we call this um, process like geo-enabling of the health information system, which is embedding the spatial data and the use of GIS at uh, various stages of the uh, capacity and, and of the business processes of the, um, the, the Ministry of Health and of the data department. So this implies supporting countries in the formation of an adequate institutional enabling environment, including strategic visions, governance policies, and resources that can accompany and support uh, the technical environment. There's a number of guidances that have we have contributed to listed here uh, and we can help in this process. 
uh, the process um, by which we implement the GIS solutions um, or geo-enable our health programs uh, can itself be accelerated by the existence, the existence of this institutional framework. And in turn, uh, in a case where the level of geo-enablement geo under the health information system might have gaps, we can use the deployment of a specific GIS application in a specific program to stimulate this institutional framework. We have done this in many countries and there are resources and expertise uh, to lead this process. So in more practical terms, here is what the process of deploying GIS solutions would be, would look like at country level. And I'm using the example of GIS-based microplanning because uh, of the many GIS applications, uh, it's probably amongst those that require a stronger level of effort uh, in terms of engagement of local stakeholders. Um, after initial, initial project phases that are common to other programs like identifying challenges, a consultant with HQ and our own possible solutions and get the government buy-in, one of the first steps that we promote is the assessing of the country GIS context. And this to understand what GIS data and capacity are already existing in the government that we can leverage. This assessment allows us to establish a solid costed work plan for deployment. And until here, this can be done with support from UNICEF HQ and regional office. But at this stage, we are in the position of establish technical partners if needed, either a local institutions, ideally, or an internal international contractor that can lead the technical part of the work. We then have a series of technical phases, including uh, the consultation with end users to understand the local arrangements of service delivery that needs to be reproduced in the GIS, uh, gather, uh, see what data are available, what gaps in the local data that might need to be filled, and we might have in some cases want to train local health staff to collect more GIS data and clean, validate those. Finally, GIS products can be produced in the case uh, of GIS microplanning, this will be the, the GIS maps for microplanning. Uh, and uh, we uh, generally want to assess and document uh, generally in pilot uh, areas, uh, how these products are used, whether they are successfully used, what impact they have on the microplanning process and eventually on the immunization outcomes. And with this evidence at hand, we can, uh, we're then in the position to revise a strategy and uh, sort of scaling this process to larger regions or nationally. Uh, the pilot project have the effect of raising awareness in the Ministry of Health on both the benefits, but also the gaps in the enabling environment for sustainable deployment of the GIS solutions. And we can use this traction to advocate for uh, uh, strengthening the enabling environment. I'm not putting a timeline here as um, uh, many of these processes depend also on political times, but for this kind of deployments, GIS-based microplanning, we're looking at somewhere between you know, six months to a year or more to complete a full pilot and document a full pilot uh, uh, and, and, and go to scale. So what about uh, costing? Um, there, um, it's hard to define ballpark figures for the variety of GIS applications we have discussed. Uh, and this because the cost uh, is really highly dependent on a number of factors. Uh, the type of GIS applications and the level of spatial detail required of the output is a major driver. The modality of deployment strongly affects cost. Uh, as we have seen in previous slides, if there's a need for high level involvement of Ministry of Health personnel in data collection and management, cost will increase accordingly. Um, the existing maturity of the country enabling environment also is a factor, especially in case in uh, with regards to the availability of quality core data sets on health facilities, settlements, health boundaries, and whether we can use existing GS technical capacity in the MOH or have to create this capacity. And ultimately, the extent of the geographic area of interest will also determine the cost. So it's, it's hard to give absolute numbers without a more detailed assessment of the specific case, but uh, just to give you a few uh, guidelines, um, and noting that these figures uh, and these implementation times are indicative and specific to the country context. On one hand, 
Uh, on the left side, we have applications like mapping zero low spatial distribution from recent census and surveys that require a low level of involvement of government personnel and capacity building efforts if census and survey data are available and can be implemented within a matter of months, weeks to months, uh, and have limited costs. Uh, on the other hand of the spectrum, you have the deployment of GS-based microplans in a context like Myanmar, um, an effort that included a high level of Ministry of Health engagement, local training of health workers, and engagement of district level personnel, and uh, leading to uh, over a year of uh, timeline for deployment and up to a million dollars of cost. Now, in terms of costing considerations, um, I would see it in two way, in two two way. Uh, there's the cost associated to building GIS institutional capacity and the cores of special assets, which are costs that can be shared across programs and includes the um, infrastructure for GIS, software for printers, the purchase and maintenance of GIS enabled devices. Um, operational cost for maintaining the core geospatial data, uh, possibly salaries for maintaining a GIS technical unit in the Ministry of Health. All these costs are not specific to the program because then they'll, they can be reused across the health sector. So there, there, there's opportunity there for cost sharing between programs. And then on top of that, you have the cost for specific deployments uh, like fees, for a national expert for spatial analysis and modeling, uh, cost of workshop for users' consultations and training about specific applications, um, and uh, a cost of collection of specific additional data. Um, for example, if we need uh, data on schools, locations uh, for education program um, to, to support the zero dose agenda, uh, and those are not part of the uh, global data or the re, uh, country data sets we might need to uh, cost for additional uh, data collections. But these are just some general, you know, uh, comprehensive list of, of costing items to be uh, uh, considered. So there's a recommendation of um, uh, thinking about cost sharing between programs for some of the core infrastructure and, and capacity. So in terms of fundings, um, I can mention here um, uh, how what 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 we used in the past for other uh, in in other countries and regions. Um, there's opportunities for GS investments, uh, specifically in all the Gavi funding streams, since the zero dollars agenda is, is the driving factors. Uh, currently, the equity acceleration funding streams, uh, but also um, other uh, initiatives, and I invite you to uh, explore um, on the uh, Gabi websites what is relevant to the, your specific country. There's also opportunities for cross-sectional GIS investments uh, that can uh, provide some of this um, cross-sectoral uh, GIS capacity that might will be relevant to the zero dose agenda, uh, like the global funds. Uh, resilient sustainable systems for health, um, the World Health Pandemic Fund. Uh, we have seen many countries, uh, including GIS applications, uh, to support um, surveillance, to support uh, resi uh, resilient and sustainable systems for health that will contribute to um, the zero dose uh, agenda. And then bilateral opportunities that are uh, country specific. Uh, there is no specific uh, uh, funding uh, within UNICEF uh, to support GIS working countries. Uh, we always uh, support um, uh, countries in uh, leveraging uh, these various opportunities. Uh, how we, can we support this process um, from headquarters and with support from regional office? Uh, we can support engagement uh, of uh, to sensitize the Minister of Health on the benefits of GS investments and uh, promoting the definition of a vision and a strategy and a roadmap for uh, geo-enabling the health information systems uh, and the program itself. 
uh, we can assist in um, uh, costing uh, deployment of specific application uh, for specific country context and uh, support a compilation of uh, quality review uh, of funding proposals. We can um, help you identify appropriate appropriate GIS application based on your needs, um, support the assessment of the uh, GIS context in the country, um, uh, support quality reviews of uh, work plans uh, once we have identified uh, this and provide access to guidance, to documents, toolkits um, uh, to support this process. Um, and there's also some uh, facilitation on access to GIS software licenses and agreements um, uh, available. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, we can uh, help uh, with drafting uh, just for rep terms or references and RFPs for contracting, for job descriptions. Um, uh, we can um, uh, help you select um, from digital rosters uh, and long-term agreements that UNICEF has for just special services support. And uh, uh, I will uh, stop there. Uh, and um, thank you for um, listening. And I hope this has been useful. And we have some uh, some more time uh, for some questions before um, we uh, close. And I'll leave you with uh, uh, the slide that provides all the uh, list of references and guidances that have been used for this uh, presentation. Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Rocco. That was a really clear and exceedingly comprehensive presentation, not just on how GIS can be used for the zero dose agenda, but implementation steps, associated costs and analysis of costs and timelines, and how um, country offices can reach out to you or Maria or the regional office for support. Um, we've had a few people drop off and they've requested the slides and the recording. So we'll share that with everyone, including participants who are not able to join us today. Um, I want to open the floor up for questions from our audience. You should be able to come off mute or you can raise your hand. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come through, Rocco, um, Karen from um, El Salvador had a question around um, the ArcGIS, and maybe you could talk for a moment about ArcGIS and whether you've used it. Um, and Karen, maybe you could let us know whether you have access to that in your country. Thank you. Uh, are we waiting for Karen to, or can I respond? Yes. Um, yeah, so ArcGIS is uh, the um, proprietary um, GIS software, is the leading GIS uh, solution um, globally. Uh, it provides a comprehensive uh, set of tools um, that essentially can allow any type of uh, both desktop analysis, it can allow deployment of mobile GIS services on tablets. Uh, it provides, it allows um, enterprise uh, level um, of uh, management of your spatial data in, in, in a closed ecosystems. Um, it, it is costly. There are uh, alternatives uh, such as QGIS, which um, are open source. Um, they um, are not as a uh, tight and 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 they're not such an ecosystem and, um, and therefore require a little bit more technical capacity uh, to um, um, to really be able to maintain a full GIS system with with open source solutions. So the cost probably might uh, uh, offset. Um, with the, the additional capacity that you might need. Um, there's there's also, you know, in order to apply GIS, we don't necessarily need to go to a full-blown uh, GIS uh, solution. There are dedicated GIS tools um, and uh, an increasing number of platforms that are uh, designed to do specifically, you know, certain, certain part of the analysis. Uh, for example, DHIS2, um, uh, it has a GIS map module 
that allows some level of utilization of uh, population mappings um, uh, to uh, and, and GIS maps uh, to visualize the HS2 uh, services. Um, so um, the uh, the utilization of a full uh, ArcGIS enterprise solution is uh, is is useful. Um, and for example, we, we've seen it in Iraq, um, where the ministry, the UNICEF has supported the Ministry of Health in establishing uh, an ESRI enterprise solution that will allow them. Um, to use GIS for a variety of applications across uh, the health sector, but um, that requires a certain vision for uh, how this is going to be used uh, across multiple multiple programs. Over. Thanks, Rato. Um, I see Bomar has his hand up, and Karen, I'm not sure if you wanted to jump in with anything. Maybe you could drop a comment into the chat um, while Bomar's speaking. Bomar, you're, please welcome and come off mute. Thanks, Emily. Uh, no, the question was because in El Salvador, some organization use it in humanitarian issues. So that's why I'm asking you if there is a use for health or for humanitarian subject or everything. So I, I just want to know, but it's a kind of similar, right? Because you use it like the same in health, in nutrition, in wash, Etc. Thank you. Thank you, Rocco. Yes, yes, confirm. Like as, as I said before, EGS is a program is agnostic, it's program agnostic. It's like saying Excel. Uh, you know, it can be used to do deal with any program. So if there is an existing ESRI ArcGIS used in, in education, you can use the, the same capacity and the same infrastructure, the, the same software to uh, deal with any uh, health programs related GIS needs. Back to maybe uh, I think Omar, uh, Bomar. Hello, uh, thank you so much, Rocco, for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, my question is: Let's say, yeah, in my country, I'm from Nicaragua. Uh, we know that the Ministry of Health has already. Uh, using GIS and, and has like all the health units uh, in a map with the coordinates and has all this database. Uh, and now let's say we want to also uh, use GIS to, to monitor or to follow up the work community health workers are doing. Uh, my question it could be how uh, based on, on your experience, how can, how can we warrant the compatibility between the, let's say, the, the new GIS system of community health worker we are proposing and the existing uh, GIS system of the Ministry of Health? Uh, is there any advice uh, you can do? Thank you so much. Thank you, Bomar. So, if, if I understand, uh, you're saying that the that the ministry has a database of health facilities location, and uh, UNICEF is interested in uh, adding or, 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 in addition, having, for example, um, community health workers uh, mapping, and 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 what will be the relation in between uh, the two? Um, I think what 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 I how I would go about that is to have a conversation uh, with the Ministry of Health about where, how, and how they're managing that information, uh, because um, uh, somehow, somewhere, uh, the list of health facilities and their coordinates is going to be stored, um, whether it's stored in an Excel file or whether it's stored in a uh, GIS dedicated server. That will make a big difference, um, and in that case, then um, UNICEF would uh, look at. Uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, build the, if you want to build, for example, a community health worker um, uh, map or, or list, the geolocated list of community health workers, uh, we would want to le le leverage, uh, a, a link it to the same GIS servers where this is, um, where the ministry is maintaining that, if it's a GIS server. If the ministry is maintaining this in, uh, 
something like an Excel uh, sheet that is uh, notoriously not the best and more efficient way to maintain your spatial data, then we might, we could potentially work with the ministry to um, promote, advocate for the establishment of uh, proper um, uh, GS servers um, so that both the health facilities list and the community of worker list can uh, essentially be hosted on the same uh, solutions that will allow uh, easily to uh, um, uh, integrate between the two in terms of uh, doing the analysis. I hope that uh, partially answered the question. Thank you so much. Um, Rocco, it might be nice if we could set a follow-up call up with Bomar and team, and maybe we can learn a little bit more about what's happening in Nicaragua and um, how we might be able to support. Sure. Um, it will probably be my, uh, the, the Maria. <laughs> That's what point. I was going to say. Maybe we should move <laughs> to the last slide. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did we go into? Ah, this last slide, yeah. So colleagues, um, these are the, the names and email addresses of all of us, but um, Rocco, maybe you should talk about the next few months and, and your scheduling. Yes, maybe we should have added uh, Maria's name there. I will, will Emily, please, will will we share uh, the the contact of the person that will substitute me as uh, I will be uh, away for uh, on paternity leave for a couple of months uh, from June to November. So, um, but there'll be uh, uh, GS uh, support um, uh, from from my team uh, through Maria Minitz. Uh, so yeah, th thank you, Emily, for uh, uh, redirecting um, any um, uh, need for additional support uh, to Maria. Absolutely. Well, we are a little bit over time. Um, if there are any other questions, please feel free to follow up with Rocco or with myself, um, and we're happy to support. As Rocco said, he's going to be out on paternity leave shortly, but um, his um, replacement will be available as well. Thank you all for joining. We'll share the slides and the recording shortly. I hope everyone has a nice weekend. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you for everybody.